All right, so this will be the, the next video. I thought I had a meeting and then I forgot that I would have to shut down the one video to open another one. So now I've got a third recording, but that's all right because you could probably only take in so much at a time anyway. So this one will start with John Locke. And as I said in the previous recording, this is really important for understanding the mindset of Westerners when they colonized all of your countries and the mindset of Americans today. It just persists and it's a major factor in why we cannot address climate issues because the United States has enough money and power so that if they resist, um, other countries just are at, at their mercy. Um, it will change, it will change in this decade, but if you wanna know how it got as bad as it got, this is the way to understand it. So in chapter five of Locke's uh, treatise, he rejects the divine right of kings. He rejects inherited wealth. At the time, the wealthy people were landed aristocrats. They had estates. And so they didn't have to work for their wealth. It was inherited. So Locke started a philosophy where you have to work in order to um, have wealth. I mean, material prosperity. So he presents this view of the state of nature. He's starting all over. He's giving this completely new model of human beings. So the way he pictures it as everyone is born by nature, free and equal. So societies that are just are the ones that maximize the individual freedom and equality of each person. So these are the ultimate values now, personal freedom to choose whatever I want in life and equality, right? Equal uh, power in relation to someone else. Um, all right, so, so, but within that context, you're born free and equal, but you're, and God gave the earth to human beings for the purpose of help, helping them provide for their own well-being, but you have to work. <laughs> Remember the story of Adam and Eve after the fall, Adam has to work, okay? So if you're a rational person, you will work hard and you will work up the land. Instead of having a landed estate, you'll get some land, you'll cut down the trees, you'll plant crops, you'll give it value. The land in itself has no value and you, you don't deserve any kind of wealth that's unearned. You've got to work. So you work it up, you give that land value, you exchange with other people. So Locke preferred a barter system because in a barter system, nobody gets to have more than they need because the crops would just rot. So um, I, I barter my corn from my farm to trade with the candle maker, whatever. And, you know, candle maker doesn't want to hoard candles. There's only so many candles they can use, right? Shoemaker isn't going to have 50 pair of shoes. So in a barter system, people will naturally get a lot of different kinds of things, but they won't get too much. Um, so that would be his ideal as everybody works for what they have and they deserve the fruit of their labor, right? When they work, they deserve to have this value and then they can trade for it. Um, so what is also true is that on this view, your view of reasoning, right? So reason 
take scientific knowledge or the knowledge you get just from experience about how to exploit nature. So a rational person is always calculating the most efficient means to his or her own economic well-being. So you're really rational and you're really virtuous in the eyes of God if you can take that a piece of land and plant crops or uh, cut down trees and create, uh, sell the wood or make furniture, make houses, whatever, but you can use that land to create value and you're really good at it. That's the ultimate virtue and it's very rational. And if you don't do that, you are evil in the sight of God. You're lazy and contentious and you're irrational. Okay. So on this view, that, that is the view that the Europeans brought with them when they came and they pushed Native Americans off the land because they were not giving it value. They also were not Christian. So you try to convert them to Christianity, try to get them to exploit the land. And when they resisted, when they didn't want the Europeans taking over what they thought was their land, and uh, they, the Europeans, this was their philosophy that justified genocide, right? Kill them all. They're not, they're not uh, Christian. They're, they don't, you know, we're trying to convert them. They resist. They're going to go to hell. And they're also ruining the land because they're not using it. And so they're more primitive. We're superior. We have our Christianity, we have our science, we have our technology, we have our reasoning, and they, and they resist it, so they deserve to be killed. This is also the philosophy that the West took with it when it colonized, right? They didn't say, you know, I'm going to go beat the tar out of those people in India and take, take every last thing I can because I'm a greedy SOB. You know, they didn't say that. They said, we have all this advancement. We're superior. We can, these other countries have all these resources, but they're not using them. And that's not virtuous. And that's not what God wants. So God wants us to go there and take those um, resources, bring them back to Europe, uh, for example, with India, they grow the tea in India, bring it back to England, put it through the industrial factory, make a tea bag and sell it back everywhere at about 500 times the profit. This is rational and this is God's will. So that's what they did. That's the philosophy. It's not a complicated philosophy. It's a very simple philosophy and it's supposed to be because you just keep hammering it into people. And people, you know, it can be a very popular philosophy because it's simple. It's also simplistic, it's not true. And it, it has led to a lot of problems. But anyway, it explains why Donald Trump was the only president who took the US out of the Paris Climate Accords. So other countries' political leaders, they might not they, they make promises to reduce their carbon footprint. They can't get votes from resisting uh, belief in climate change. It's not a matter of belief. It's what's happening around them. They can see it. So in developing nations suffer more from climate change. They're more vulnerable. So their citizens don't question it. It's just that <coughs> the leaders might say, yes, we're all on board but they can't follow through on that because if some American or Western company comes in and says, look, if you let me mine your minerals or cut down your trees or uh, dig for oil, I'll give you all these jobs and it will increase your country's uh, gross national product and it will make you a popular politician. And if you say no, you're not going to get reelected because people want jobs. So, um, 
So Westerners use that philosophy and Americans still use that philosophy. Um, the other thing about it is that in America, it's so difficult for us to get environmental protection laws uh, because what those laws require is that you tell people how they can use their land, right? What they can and cannot do with their land or their factory or their technology, whatever it is, they use their reason to create or to exploit in order to give value, to sell a product other people want. They don't want the government telling them what to do, right? Good old John Locke, minimal government intervention. You just allow these rational calculators to do their thing and everything will turn out just peachy keen. Um, all right, so the big controversy at the time for Locke was political stuff. And um, his position was minimal government intervention. The only purpose of government is to protect people, people's rights to life, health, liberty, and possessions. So if somebody murders somebody, right, the government comes in. So it's the police and the military. So you protect the nation from being invaded and you protect individual citizens from being murdered or being their health being um, undermined by another citizen or their possessions. Somebody takes their stuff or their freedom, right? Somebody prevents them from doing what they want. So that's it. That's uh, Locke's philosophy and it, it really dominates American thinking to this day a lot. And the reason why Europe isn't as in love with Locke has to do with what we will see later on. Um, okay. There, yeah, so the Republican party basically doesn't even believe in environmental laws in principle. Right. And so, of course, they do everything they can to appoint people that will not apply the laws. So if the legislature, well, they try to control the legislature um, by fossil fuel companies pay for the political campaigns. So the people that get elected uh, are puppets for the fossil fuel industry and they will create laws that promote fossil fuels. But even when a legislature makes a law that limits fossil fuels, the judicial branch has to apply the law and um, um, slap a fine on Exxon or the corporations. And if the judiciary is controlled by the Republican party, which it has been trying to do, whenever they vote for a president, they get a whole lot of judicial appointments. Okay, and then even if the judge or the jury says you've got to put these guys in prison or something. If you, or you have to execute, um, you have to follow the environmental protection guidelines. If the person at the environmental protection agency, which is the agency that makes sure there's compliance, make sure people are following the laws. If you put people in charge of that who don't care, if the fossil fuel companies are following the laws, so they won't, you know, uh, identify violations of the law. It's just like, it, they, we resist it, right? The Republican party, fossil fuel people, they resist at every step of the way and they do it based on principle, based on Locke's worldview, not just on I'm corrupt and proud of it, right? And that's why the public, the American public will continue to vote for those people because they really like the principle of keep the government out of my life. Okay, so during the COVID, uh, these, this group of people that believe in this stuff in principle, they resisted wearing masks so that the government is telling me when I can breathe or not, 
right? It's government trying to control my breathing and it's government trying to control my life. I'm not going to wear a mask. I'm not going to get a vaccine. I have a right to say no. So very important that these people are taught what's called rugged individualism. We're all individuals. We all have freedom to do what we want. They don't think about this is a public health problem. So Mr. Fauci was always answering the Republicans by saying, this is a public health issue. <laughs> that what we're recommending is what you have to do to protect other people's health because we're all citizens and we all have to work together. And this is what an extreme view of love just absolutely uh, children grow up without any idea that they're getting completely indoctrinated into this point of view. I know because I taught in a place where the college students had never heard the expressions public service, public policy, public well-being. And if they would hear it, it's socialism, like it's Karl Marx and it's the government taking over. And they always talk about the government and they have no idea what they're talking about <laughs> because most of them, they need public education. They need public health care. They need public, they need all this stuff worse than a rich person does, but they just don't get it. They don't get their hatred of government is really hurting them. And they keep voting for politicians who make government dysfunctional. So they make it hateful, and then the people hate it and vote for even less. And it's, it's a terrible problem. Now, Locke understood the corrupting power of greed. I mean, Aristotle talks about it in Plato. It's not true because Aristotle said so, but they were raised with theirs. They know this stuff really well, and they do understand greed. And so he condemned the creation of money he really wanted people to be generous. So if you remember when we covered Aristotle, there was pleasure. There were the two survival instincts, pleasure and fear. But the very next one was generosity and then magnanimity. So it was just um, avoiding greed, avoiding hoarding, um, because that, that shrinks the middle class. And so Locke really understood that. In his day, in the context of America, and Locke was an advisor to the founding fathers of America, you could argue that his philosophy was the best way to create a thriving middle class, is to give people the opportunity to come to America, work up the land, create value or create a product like shoes or candles or something and um, flourish would lead to a middle class. But once we got corporations and once we got the world we have, I think, I think Locke would value having government intervention to limit greed and to maintain a middle class. But that's an application of the principles. And if you just obsess about the principles, we don't have a middle class. As long as people are obsessed about it, the middle class will shrink and shrink and shrink. So our country is just stuck in this ideological. It's a battle about ideas and it's having a profound effect on our destruction of the environment and our destruction of our own middle class and our destruction of our own democracy. Because if too many people have all the too few people have all the money, then it's not a democracy anymore. Um, let's see. Okay, so that was the document, the three page document on property rights. Then I have another attachment, which shows how Locke takes this view of rights, which applies to the economic system, property, applies to the political system. He applies it also to marriage, to family life, 
to um, association. So there's all sorts of, he's trying to create a whole new idea to think about all aspects of culture and he's separating church and state. So his view of marriage in particular, this is very radical, it's extremely radical at the time, is that you might believe that God ordains your marriage. It's God's will that these two people are brought together. That's in the marriage ceremony in a church. But if both parties freely and equally want to have a divorce, they consent to be divorced, they want to be divorced, the judge, right? He represents the secular authority, the civil society. The judge should make divorce legal. He, the judge does not judge you based on whether you're gonna go to hell or not, whether this is God's will. That's faith. Over here, we have facts. And we have free, equal, consenting adults. And they agree to this, fine. So um, the other thing is that a rational person would have children because that's their way to thrive, but they also would provide for them economically. So they would not get divorced until they could provide for them economically. And then um, also in a divorce, the man has been outside of the family working hard and creating value and so he has a right to keep all of the family's money if he was, if she didn't work, which of course she can't work because that's not culturally possible. It's also illegal for the most part. So the man is the one that's been working for material resources and he deserves every penny. So the woman has used her labor to raise the children. So if she was a good mother, her children will provide for her, right? That's the fruit of her labor. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the likelihood of getting divorced would tend to lead to starving. So, you know, there are a lot of, not a lot of choices for women there, uh, but that's the way it was. And it made sense within this context. So I, I want to get you into this mindset so that you can make, so you can understand it. Um, so the difference between rational calculation of your own economic self-interest versus wisdom to me is really fundamental. It is the cornerstone of everything that goes on. Um, all right. So Aristotle had the moral virtues, the intellectual virtues, practical wisdom, theoretical wisdom. John Locke takes one of those intellectual virtues rational calculation, and he makes that the number one uh, intellectual exercise that should determine value, all other ideas of good and evil, justice and injustice in the secular world. Aristotle was about bio biology. He's about the boots on the ground world. He's not about faith or salvation or anything like that. Whereas Locke says, in this world, it's rational calculation, and that's what God wants us to do. And so you assume you're going to go to heaven that way. Um, for Aristotle, it's wisdom, which is natural, and also every major religion values those same character traits. So there shouldn't really be a gap at all. All right. Um, all right. So... Locke rejected Aristotle and also the Catholic Church had assimilated Aristotle. So that's why Locke, Locke was Protestant. He wasn't Catholic. And that's why his worldview is called the Protestant work ethic. The Protestants were at the forefront of um, changing from the traditional view to the Newtonian Co Copernicus modern worldview. Um, and they also want to change political. They want to change all aspects of culture. Um, and then the last part of that outline is about the economic system, okay? So Adam Smith was also in England and economically the entrenched wealthy class, the aristocrats 
who had these estates. They also controlled the political process and they made laws, economic laws that would favor, that would keep them rich, which is, you know, what goes on in America right now. But if you had a sheep farm up in Scotland and, and that was what you were good at, you would put a big tariff on anybody else in the world uh, trying to sell wool, right, into England because you wanted to be, have a monopoly, right? So, um, so what Adam Smith said was that you should really get rid of all those tariffs. And if the British can make the best sweaters because the weather in Britain makes for good sheep and good, and good uh, you know, sheep's good wool, then they should make it and sell it to France. And if France makes good wine because of the weather in France, they should make wine and sell it in England and no tariffs. The tariffs just lead to people having to pay higher prices for worse products. So if you take the tariffs off, competition will lead to the best quality at the lowest price. So that was what Adam Smith advocated. But Adam Smith was also very concerned about greed. And he wrote a whole book, The Theory of Sentiments. And he wanted the most important virtue to be generosity. Once again, <laughs> he called it beneficence. But he gets it. He gets what Locke understood. He gets what Aristotle understood. And he gets, you know, that if you have a free market, but you have greedy people, you're not going to have a democracy. You're not going to have a middle class. He understood that. Um, so those are the themes for this particular class. Uh, what, if you talk about, there's a stereotype that the Western world is individualistic, materialistic oriented, um, equality oriented, uh, exploits nature, uh, con uh, considers that people are poor because they're lazy, <laughs> And all, all these assumptions, you can all put them together in this very internally consistent, simple, easy to grasp onto worldview, but it's also too simplistic. And the people who invented it were aware that it has this Achilles heel, it has this weakness that if people are greedy, it's not gonna work. Uh, <laughs> So that's what we've got now. And people in developing countries, I think, need to understand that because their countries have been very affected by the worldview that's driven the behavior, that's driven how they get treated. Okay, that's it for this class. And so I hope you listen to these recordings look over the readings, and the next time we have class, we will start out with that, and then I will move into Kant in the last perhaps hour. But uh, you don't have to read Kant. I will anticipate it. I will show the you the documents before I send them on the stream because I don't want people to look at that and think, ah, <laughs> all right? Just see if you could handle these. And hopefully you can after I've talked and talked. Okay.